Sabbe satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dave Jacobson and I'd like to talk to you today about false hopes and false fears. It seems like everyone these days is going through a lot of changes. I know I am and people around me are. And the temptation is to get caught up in these false hopes. Well, what do I mean by a false hope? To wish that things were otherwise than they are is a false hope. We can also call this desire or maybe even fantasy <laughs> that we wish somehow things would change in a way that we consider favorable or desirable. And this is actually the cause of suffering. When this becomes a negative thing, in other words, when we wish things would change to be otherwise than the way they are because we don't like the way they are, this becomes fear. So between our false hopes and our false fears, we spend a lot of time dreaming, thinking about the way we would like it to be, whether it's because we want something that we don't have or we don't want something that we do have, whether we want to be someplace else or be with someone else or be in a different condition of life, these are all desires, and they have this one thing in common, that we want things to be otherwise than they are. So this leads to a problem, an existential problem, that the Buddha calls thisness and thatness, or suchness and otherwiseness. Uh, we want the world to be something else than it is. And of course, this creates a tension, and this tension, this unsatisfactoriness that we feel, is called dukkha. Dukkha means suffering, and not just uh, physical suffering, but mental suffering as well. And as we all experience, the mental suffering can be far more painful, far more difficult to overcome than the physical. So the cause of the mental suffering that we undergo is only our own desires, only our own wishes to have things otherwise. Huh? We, first of all, make a distinction between thusness and otherwiseness. Now, the world is thus. The world is such. But I want it to be some other way. So maybe I take up a line of effort and work, or maybe I spend money that uh, I have accumulated to get something, or maybe I establish a new relationship with someone, or change the relationship I already have. So many things that we can do out of a desire to change the way it is. But guess what? The way it is, is now. The way we want it to be is in a future now. So we create past and future by our own desires, our own striving, our own lust and greed, clinging and attachment for things that we want. What happens when we do that is that we create a false hope. The false hope is that if somehow or other things would change in the way we want them to, then we would be happy. Then everything would be all right. Then we would feel pleasure. Then we would feel whatever it is we want to feel. But what happens then is that we start going against the way things are. 
It's just like the Buddha describes a whirlpool. In a whirlpool, water comes down the stream and it hits an obstacle like a rock. And when it hits the rock, it is pushed around against the main current. And because it's pushing against the main current, eventually it gets overwhelmed and pushed back again the other way. And then again it hits the obstacle and it goes round and round and round. We see this in nature a lot. The earth is going around the sun. The winds are going around the earth. Uh, whirlpools are a good example. Cyclones, hurricanes, uh, any kind of a vortex is simply when the energy of a flow tries to go against the main flow and then it winds up going around and around and it's never resolved. The only way to resolve it is to remove the obstacle. So I'm sure those of you who know a little of Buddhism will see what's coming. <laughs> Nature is a flow. Nature is like water. It has definite laws. It seeks the lowest uh, common denominator. It fills up all the gaps in the middle and it simply flows. That's its nature. You can't change it. You can't stop it. So nature is flowing in its own way according to its own laws and principles. And then it hits an obstacle. This obstacle we can call ego or the sense of self or I. And this obstacle is going, wait a minute, I don't like the way this is flowing. I want to turn around and go against it the other way, in some different way, whatever it is. And so the ego makes up this dream. If only things would change, if only I would get this or do that or go here or have this, then I would be happy. So it makes an effort against the flow, against nature. And because of this, there's suffering. And what's the result? What individual can prevail against the whole nature? So <laughs> the backwards current gets turned around again, and then it hits the obstacle again. No, wait a minute. I don't like the way things are. I want to change it. I want to do this, go there, or have that, or do something else, or whatever it is. So because of this desire, this false hope, or to look at it the other way, the false fear that, oh, this and that could happen, and then I would be in a bad way. I would be suffering. Well, why would you be suffering? Oh, because I want it to be this way, not that way. So in either case, we're going against the nature, against the flow, uh, against the natural way of things. And because of that, we feel pain. It's an effort, an unnecessary effort, and mainly is a mental effort. But it can also translate into the physical world as unnecessary work, unnecessary striving, unnecessarily piling up resources for things that we don't need, and so on. So what is the answer to this? Well, it's easy to say, just relax and give up your ego. But to do that is actually very difficult. So it's one of those things that are simple in principle, but very difficult in application. So let's look into it a little bit more and see if we can understand the mechanism involved and get some insight into how to handle it. The Buddha, of course, talks about this problem a lot. <laughs> Let me read an excerpt from the suttas. One who is dependent has wavering. One who is independent has no wavering. There being no wavering, there is calm. There being calm, there is no yearning. There being no yearning, there is no coming or going. There being no coming or going, 
there is no passing away or arising. There being no passing away or arising, there is neither a here nor a there nor an in-between. This, just this, is the end of stress and suffering. That's from the Udana, number eight. So, this is Nibbana. This is a description of the state of peace, of calm, of balance, of naturalness, ordinariness, that is attained by a person who becomes self-realized. And let's look at each one of these. One who is dependent has wavering. Why is that? Because our existence in conditional life is a dependent arising. Dependent on certain causes that went before. Because of the causes that went before, then we are the way we are now. But because nature is always changing, those causes are always changing too. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not there. Sometimes they're one flavor and sometimes they're a different flavor. Uh, we say, I'm having a good day or I'm having a bad day. Dependent on what? Dependent on some external cause or causes. So we're dependent. Because we're dependent, we're wavering. I have a good day, I have a bad day. <laughs> sometimes I get what I want, sometimes I don't. This is wavering. Wavering means our internal state is always changing. Because our internal state is always changing, then we have no peace. And because we have no peace, we yearn, we have desire, we want things to be other than they are. You see? We have no peace because we're dependent on causes outside ourselves, whether we have a good day or a bad day, whether we're enjoying or suffering. But actually, to be dependent is itself a suffering condition because we have no control. We're simply swept away by whatever causes there are. So, if we can give up this yearning, if we can give up this desire, there will be no coming and going. Coming and going means I'm here, but I want to go there. Or I'm there, but I want to go someplace else. <laughs> and on and on. And that means no birth and death. This is how the yogi or the monk or the meditator becomes free from birth and death. He becomes free from the causes that give rise to yearning, dissatisfaction, desire, and due to ignorance, thinking that if we somehow can change the conditions, then everything will be better. Or if we can somehow change the conditions, that things won't be so bad. <laughs> this is false hope. And it's also a false fear, based on false fear, that if I'm not in control, then my life will be insufferable, horrible, terrible, bad. This is the fear that we have or that the ego has. So now, the Buddha is talking about the difference between relative consciousness and absolute consciousness. In relative consciousness, there is a here and a there. There is a now and a then. There is a thusness and an otherwiseness. There is a suchness and a non-suchness. And we want to move between the two. We want to travel. We want to change. And this is the backwards flowing current that goes against the stream of the flow of nature and causes us so much difficulty. So how do we become independent from this? How do we become free from this cause and effect? First of all, we have to understand what we are. We are not a self. We are not a person. We are not an I. 
if we look inside ourselves, we can't find this I anywhere. We can't find this personality or this self. If we're honest, we have to admit that we project this idea of self on things and people around us. We say, my friend, my camera, my water, my body, my mind, I, I, I. And this I, if we look into it deeply, we find to be based on the idea of mine. So as soon as we say something is mine, and we do this dozens of times a second, every time we perceive something, what we perceive is actually not the thing itself, but simply a symbol or a sign that is created by our senses. So everything that we are conscious of is simply a symbol, a sign, a notion, an idea, a concept. And because it's a concept, it can't really satisfy us. So even if we get what we want, even if we're able to change things in the way we intend to, we're still not going to be completely satisfied. There's always going to be some unsatisfactoriness. And then that leads to the next desire, and the next desire, and the next, and the next. And it's a vicious circle. We can't break out of it. But we can break out if we give up this obstacle called I. If we give up this idea of a self, this fixed notion of identity. Everything in nature is constantly changing. And if we're honest with ourselves, we have to admit that we're always changing too. The music I liked uh, 10, 20 years ago is not the music I like today. The food I liked when I was a baby is not the food that I like today. The body is changing. Our needs are changing. Our activities are changing. Our mind is changing. In fact, the Buddha noted that the mind changes so fast that there's no adequate simile or metaphor <laughs> to explain how fast the mind is changing. Mind can go from one corner of the universe to the other in less time than you can think about. So, there is no stability. There is no... Uh, constant thing in nature. Everything's changing. That's all right. That's just the way it is. Okay? But right now, the way it is, is called suchness. And one who is such doesn't have to change because he allows himself to be whatever he is. There's a, a Tibetan meditation, tantric meditation, that's very nice. And it goes like this. Observe your mind. Allow it to be the way it is. Don't get involved. Simply observe the mind. Allow it to be the way it is. And don't get involved. In other words, don't try to change it. That's the key. Don't try to change anything. Yourself, others around you. We all know it's common wisdom that trying to change the other person in a relationship never works. It always backfires. Why? Because if we love someone, we love them the way they are. You know, warts and all. <laughs> and we don't want to change them. There may be some things about them that we don't like. That's all right. That's the way they are. Don't try to change them because it's going to lead to all kinds of problems in the relationship. Similarly, don't try to change yourself. Don't try to change nature. Don't try to change the way it is. Because that effort is what creates our suffering. I've done a lot of technical analysis of the process of becoming in the earlier videos on our site. You should look at some of those and try to understand the deeper technical aspects of the process of becoming. I'm not going to go into those now. I'm just going to talk to you like a friend. And as a friend, 
the advice I have for you is relax. Just be who you are and let the world be the way it is. Yeah, it's going to change. That's all right. We don't have to make it change one way or the other. We're going to be okay. What do I mean by we? That we're not a self, we're not a, an I, we're not a person, a personality, an identity. We are simply a space of awareness. And this space of awareness has come into being, manifested in the world, on the off chance that we might get to experience some ecstasy. And sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. But the thing about it is, if we strive, if we try, if we want to change things, we're always going to be suffering. So the Buddha says, be independent. One who is independent doesn't waver. One who is dependent doesn't go beyond the wandering on, which is of the nature of clinging to thisness and otherwiseness. Knowing this drawback, the great danger in dependencies. Independent, mindful, the monk lives the wandering life, clinging to nothing. That's from the Dvayatanupasana Sutta. So, one who is independent, one who is not uh, an I, a self, a thing subject to the causes, of changing causes of nature doesn't waver. In other words, he never sees himself as being any different. He's always just a space of awareness. Now, things come and things go. Things change. Never the same. Time moves on. Things are always in flux. But this space of awareness never changes. This space of awareness is going to be there long after this planet is uh, space dust. This space of awareness is unchangeable, immortal, unconditioned, Nibbana. So don't be dependent because one who is dependent doesn't go beyond the wandering on. Wandering on means samsara. Samsara means again and again, coming into this world, being disappointed, going out, coming back, again making a manifestation, trying to do this and that, again failing and suffering and taking another birth and again and again. Whew. Isn't it time we stop this? So one who is independent, meaning, has realized the essential nature of the space of awareness, the space of awareness that is non-being, non-manifested, free from cause and effect, free from time and space. Just a space of awareness, allowing things to happen the way they are. He is not clinging to thisness and otherwiseness. I'm not clinging either to the way it is now or some other way that I would like it to be in the future. I'm not creating time. I'm living only in the present. Not trying to comprehend or understand or control, but just allowing it to be. Allowing myself to be and allowing everything else to be just the way they are. And that's fine. Knowing this drawback, the great danger in dependencies. Dependencies are thinking that my uh, enjoyment or suffering is dependent on something outside. No. No, it's completely dependent on what we are doing in ourselves. If we're able to accept the way things are, without blame, without judgment, just acceptance, then without creating desire or wanting things to be otherwise, we attain peace. And that peace is the gateway to Nibbana. So mindful, independent, the monk lives the wandering life. 
He doesn't cling to anything. Someone asked the Buddha one time, can you sum up your teaching in one sentence? And he said, yes. One should not cling to anything whatsoever. <laughs> so this is actual spiritual life. I really don't like the word spiritual because it brings in the whole ontology of the soul and God and all that conceptual stuff. But Nibbana is actually non-conceptual. It's actually beyond the mind. It's actually beyond the idea of self and time and space and all of that. So this is the invitation of the Buddha. This is the challenge, actually, of the Buddha, that can we realize this space? Can we just accept things the way they are? Give up false hope, uh, the hope that maybe I'll acquire magical, mystical powers and be able to fly through the air or do whatever I want, get whatever I want, make people do whatever I want them to. It's a false hope. Even if you get those things, you still won't be satisfied. There'll still be something that's out of your control. So, uh, and false fears that, oh, what's going to happen when I die? Well, everybody's going to die. And what's going to happen is that we're going to dissolve into emptiness, into nothingness. So why not see this emptiness right here, right now? Why not realize this nothingness within your own self right now? This is the path of the Buddha's wisdom. And this is the way to enlightenment. This emptiness, this nothingness, peace is the gateway to Nibbana. Sabbe Satta Bhavantu Sukhitatta Bhavantu Sukhitatta Sabbe Satta Bhavantu Sukhitatta Bhavantu Sukhitatta